and we go in turn answer these questions and in the meantime uh, the audience feel free to uh, type your questions and we can take them at the end the session is not very long but um, this is going to be a very useful like alessia said before it's going to be very useful also to guide the next developments in seasonal climate forecast uh, and it's and particularly its use uh, for uh, specific applications in the industry or possibly policy moving forward uh, so for next round of funding of eu and uh, several other things so let's go for it i will call each one of you and if you can keep your answers to two minutes each and then uh, we'll uh, go to a more open questions and answer okay let's start with anchor please uh, what can forecast producers do to help climate service providers and users let me start by saying i'm not the head of seasonal forecasting the tcmwf i do coordinate though everything to do with climate predictions including seasonal for the Copernicus department of ECMWF, which is to do with services. So I'm saying that because while I'm prepared to talk about what the producers of models and the research community that does contribute to the, to the issue of seasonal forecasts, uh, I'm happy to speak on their behalf. Uh, my main concern is services. So uh, I have to agree with things that have been said before here, that uh, the science still needs to deliver more. Uh, models need improvement. Models probably need to be run at high resolution because uh, the, the current uh, the representation of the important factors is probably not sufficiently good. The uh, science can deliver larger ensembles of predictions because, as we know, whilst the resolution is not uh, possible to, to expand in uh, practical purposes, in operational setups, running larger ensemble can compensate for some of the insufficiencies and inadequacies of models at present and can offer uh, people who want to analyze this data the opportunity to do corrections to the data by post-processing. Uh, but also, I think, another group of scientists could and should improve the modeling of the impacts on a phenomenological basis. We haven't had the example here. Here, people tend to be interested in meteorological variables alone, but uh, step outside only a very little bit, and you'll see that there are applications in economic sectors where things that involve uh, impacts on hydrology, for example, on agriculture, start to play a role. At the moment, the models that are used for representing these impacts are developed, trained, and uh, designed to deal with observations or weather forecasts, which are high resolution, uh, spatial, temporal, and precision in timing of meteorological events. Whereas long range forecasts, however much the science will work at, at, at improving the models, will never deliver this. We have to remember at all times that predictability a longer time scale is a different nature than predictability of weather. And I think there is still a big gap in the, in the impact modeling to try and devise the proper transfer functions, let's call them for a minute, between the meteorology and the impact, which capitalize on the, on the information that can be delivered by long range predictions now and in the future when they become uh, even better. I'll stop here. I have more to say, but I'll wait for the next questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anka. That's a great start of the conversation. And so picking up on what you said about uh, the predictability of the system and uh, connected also to the question here, I'd like to uh, then uh, ask the same questions to Andrea, but perhaps Andrea can also uh, expand a bit on uh, what uh, you think would be the best thing in terms of uh, improving the dynamics, the science behind the seasonal forecast, or instead try to tailor it, use the current or a bit of both. So where, where do we stand? Do we need to improve the post-processing or the, uh, of the dynamics and the physics of the models to get better seasonal focus? Hello, everyone. Um, um, OK, it depends. Um, I, I would, uh, uh, yeah, I, I agree uh, with what Anka said. It's very important. And um, I, I would like to, to, to yeah, to, to a bit um, uh, look at the problem in a more general way. Um, I mean, the very important thing that, uh, in general, <laughs> um, seasonal forecaster providers need to need to do, and and Firm was a very good example of that, is to talk with end users, to learn from end users about uh, their needs, and on the other hand, also uh, teach to end users about uh, what they can better ask to seasonal uh, predictions. 
uh, it, yeah, it seems something uh, vague, but actually, um, uh, this I think is very important. Also, what, what Sir Anka said about the use of um, uh, impact models. This is very important, and the use of impact models has also to do on uh, what the users needs and has to do on uh, what the seasonal forecast can provide. And um, I think uh, the impact modelers, I mean, is another uh, um, set of people in between. So I, I also think that the gap in between the, the, the seasonal uh, forecasts and um, the end users is something we'll, by talking, by interacting more, and by also having people in between that maybe is, is neither seasonal forecaster and neither uh, um, end users that can bridge because we need uh, probably uh, inter interdisciplinary a new position in between uh, uh, to fill uh, this, um, uh, this gap and would be very, very important to do. Um, so, um, so yeah, probably I, I expanded a bit. <laughs> That's Sorry, good. Yeah. So we come back. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. So that's that's good. So the role of intermediaries, um, we normally refer to them as uh, uh, social scientists, as uh, they help uh, close the loop between the physical scientists and uh, and the users. So that's a very key role that we emphasized uh, also in uh, other parts of the meeting. And uh, I'd like to move on now to uh, Pascal. Pascal is, uh, as I said, he's got experience in both camps. Uh, he's now currently sitting on a uh, more scientific area at the Royal Meteorological uh, Institute in Belgium. But uh, uh, with your uh, experience on both camps and also having followed a bit uh, Secretary Fermat's advisory board member, what, uh, what would you answer to this question? I think what what Secli Firm has demonstrated is that uh, uh, there is a, um, a rel re some relevance for a radical change in the articulation of uh, uh, of knowledge, which uh, consists of moving from simplifying thinking uh, to connecting thinking. So, it's it's you know what I appreciate in this project is the introduction of complexity in the relationship between uh, forecast producers and and users. Um, complexity, well, if you if you look at the Et etymology complexus means uh, woven together. So uh, thinking complex in this case means really to uh, to have some sort of double movements. The, the, the first uh, will be physical, that the forecast producers have to get uh, uh, out of their silos and and, and um, uh, get uh, get closer to to the users. And the the, the second movement. Uh, is psychological. It's 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 uh, really a question of understanding the needs um, and the requirements of the users. Uh, I, I I think it cannot never be it can never never be stressed enough that uh, um, you know um, we um, we are kind of shaped in our capacities and limitations by the processes we create. So uh, setting up appropriate feedback mechanisms in the chain is, is therefore crucial. And I've seen some good examples of how things could be, could be, uh, you know, uh, could be developed uh, and um, even developed further uh, in that direction. So um, that's, that's about it really uh, in, in that sense. Uh, so what I see, I, I see is quite kind of, uh, you know, forecast producers should maybe press uh, a little bit to have in the academic world you know, uh, uh, meteorology and climate as uh, you know included in in in, in programs uh, that are not necessarily uh, you know uh, about environment, but uh, also engineering uh, programs, for example, so as to make real uh, translators, uh, you know, who, who can really understand uh, one language, uh, the language of the uh, forecast producers, and and uh, the, also the language of the. Um, Know, of the, uh, the forecast users. Okay, thank you, thank you, Pascal. So I guess what uh, what you're saying, um, in addition to what Andrea was saying, is that also there's a, a role for educators and for providing a, a, some kind of uh, additional knowledge to the users of uh, seasonal climate forecast, and that's actually something that we uh, also attempted to do with our summer school. I think uh, we did uh, pretty well with that. So uh, just a uh, uh, as an aside, everything is registered, uh, recorded, sorry, and um, and you can go online and look at all the lectures there. Several of you have been there already. Um, and let's now move towards the uh, 
um, the side of the users and see what they think about what the producer, sorry, the previous question, Sil, and uh, uh, what the producers should do to help now from the side of the user. So Marco, um, you've been heavily involved what, uh, in Secretary Firm, what is your view on, on this? Uh, well, so from a point of view of user, uh, first of all, uh, the skill. So the, the first thing is just to try to improve the skills, especially on the mid-high latitudes. For the second point uh, is to make it easy to access uh, to the seasonal forecast and in general to the products. So the already a great job uh, was made by Copernicus, uh, but sometimes you still need to process by Python uh, to scripts, uh, you know, so you need some uh, knowledge. So they, they really uh, no knowledge is users. Uh, user is, is not really able, I guess, to use, for example, Copernicus. So, just to very to make in the point of view of person that no never used an SDF or a script. I, I have in my mind the beautiful web page of NOAA, the ESRL daily composite service, where you can with a few clicks make uh, analysis or uh, correlations between uh, uh, teleconnection indexes uh, and so on. So uh, I guess so just point of view of users to keep uh, a non uh, knowledge person to be able to easily uh, use the the instruments i know that is not easy so sometimes uh, you need anyway some skill but just this is my opinion from, from point of view so sometimes it's still a bit uh, need you need us uh, some some no technical knowledge to use uh, the the data they are still uh, sometimes not very easy to access so as a to to have a very large a large uh, large usage i would say excellent so yeah so we are we are basically circling around there's a thread here about uh the connection with users and uh, uh discussing the needs and then providing education and specifically also to improve the way in which the data are interpreted and visualized i guess and uh, and, and and with all the uh statistics analysis and so on and so let's see uh, let's hear from laura now on on the same question please uh yeah thank you for the for the invitation first of all i, I would say that i truly agree with everything what was said just then, until now i would just like to emphasize the fact that uh, in addition to um the fact that c3 uh, climate services providers uh still need to teach the users i would say also they uh, that they need to learn from the users um it's about yeah uh, we talked about understanding the needs uh, and so on and so forth. And I think that some of the other gaps that are currently existing come from the fact that uh, the, the way the information is used or might be used by the users uh, is not fully understood by the, by the producers themselves. For instance, I can just mention that in the, uh, in the energy sector, for instance, when we want to do seasonal outlooks, uh, we use energy modeling tools that need to run at the same temporal resolution as the uh, energy markets, which basically is one hour in Europe. So we need information on the one hour time step. When you go to um, a climate service provider and ask for one hour resolution data, they call you just crazy man, because yeah, it's not relevant to use seasonal you know, forecast at uh, hourly resolution and so on and so forth. Uh, whereas in practice, if you understand the full process, it's not used as um, yeah time series on the hourly time series, it's just an input data which is then aggregated according to the uh, relevant way to, to use the information. So I think there are still some barriers uh, because of misunderstanding between the users and the providers. And we really need to keep on working on that. I think Secli Firm has made a very great work on this uh, by developing all the case studies. And I think this is something we should really put the, the emphasis on in the next, uh, in the next years. And uh, just another point that I think is important it's also uh, the matter of uh, joining the, the different time scales. Uh, I mean, between uh, um, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ahead, so uh, ensemble prediction systems and subseasonal forecast and seasonal forecast, because from the user perspective, it's not relevant to have this separation between the time scales. Um, and it should go in this direction to try to to erase those borders between the different uh, time scales from a methodological point of view. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. And uh, on, on the last point, very briefly, I think that's something also we explored. And um, for example, we started uh, talking about seasonal forecast, and then uh, we found out that actually what uh, users were looking for was uh, a shorter range. And, and so we stepped back a bit because it's no, there's no point in pushing the boundaries when, uh, when you lose the 
uh, the, discuss the um, attention of the users. So it, it's, it's good to take the users through the journey and starting a few steps back and then take them towards the uh, longer range. And, and in so doing, we can also extend the, the, uh, the range, like Laurent said. So what, if we move to the, the next questions now, and now we are really going into uh, a bit more deeper in uh, what the seasonal forecast modeling community should put their efforts on. So just now think about if you had the project tomorrow, where, where should we work on in terms of improving the seasonal forecasting modeling? So let's change a little bit the order now, uh, just to confuse you. So uh, Pascal. I think it's really working on, on uh, methods that, that, that will squeeze all the juice uh, from, from the forecast, really. You know, uh, uh, we've heard several times that there was some disappointment with the skill of uh, seasonal forecast in the middle latitudes. Uh, and uh, that's, that's true, even in short, at shorter range, sometimes we, we get disappointed. And I think for, uh, uh, in many situations, we have to, uh, to live with that. Um, I, one possible direction of research uh, for further development um, you know, would be to um, to look at um, um, you know refining methods uh, in order to identify windows of opportunity uh, where uh, one has more predictability. You know, uh, that's I think there is a need and there is some hope there. Um, you know, you, we 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 talked about uh, during the three conferences we talked about teleconnections and combining statistical and dynamical models. Uh, maybe there is a way there to, to tease out some information on, on predictability uh, in some situations. But uh, I would say long, long research uh, efforts would be needed in that case. Um, maybe also methods to uh, identify uh, trends in successive climate uh, forecasts. That's uh, two examples I have in mind. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Pascal. So I think you're pointing mainly to post-processing areas rather than improving the dynamics and uh, the physics of the models. Can you tell us more about your thumbs up and your, and your, and your answer to the question here? Please? Um, well, in, in practice, I would say that, um, of course, uh, in addition to improving the, the, the performance of the models and so on, uh, we should really go a step forward, especially in the, in the, in the qualification of the model performance. Uh, by that, I mean that uh, so from, a, from the meteorological and climatic point of view, uh, we use scores like uh, deterministic scores and probabilistic scores or bio score, or rocks and so on and so forth. Uh, but in practice, if we want to demonstrate the, uh, the performance of the model for specific applications, we need to evaluate uh, the performance of the models. One, it has been transferred to the uh, business uh, indicator in the I don't know, in the uh, demand modeling for, for the energy sector, for instance, or, or whatever indicator, because um, in general, the, uh, the, I would say the, the exposure to the risk or the, uh, the translation of the climate information into business information uh, is not symmetrical. For instance, uh, in the energy case, um, a cold wave in winter is more important to forecast than a, a heat wave or a warm, warm period in winter, I would say. Uh, it's much more important. So in practice, uh, we don't need the same quality of the forecast for each uh, season and for each parameter and so on. And so I would say that a big step forward would really be um, to assess the, uh, the, the performance of the forecast from the user's perspective and uh, uh, by comparing with their own uh, current practice. I mean, if the, uh, the user is using climatology, then we should compare with the climatology. The user is uh, using uh, one year of climate data, which happens sometime, uh, then it should be compared with this approach. So the, the verification process should really go uh, closer to the practical use of the information that is made uh, by the different users. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you, Laurent. That's uh, a good practical uh, recommendation. And I think this is what, uh, I mean, th that's where we started also with Secretary Firm. Uh, we, our, uh, target was to compare with the current methodology, the climatology. But of course, um, you know, even if you have many case studies, then uh, you can always argue that that the answer you get is specific to that case study. You cannot generalize and and all this. Thing. So we, yeah, we're still in that kind of um, uncertainty area, which uh, it's it's somewhat difficult to get out of. But uh, the accumulation of experiences we are 
getting through case studies. I think that's that's what's helping. And, um, and so we move now to Anka. I want to say two things relatively, uh, well, now. <clears throat> One is to agree with Pascal and Laurent, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but I don't want it to be, uh, to appear that we're completely ignoring Alberta's question, which is about what, how should the models improve dynamics and physics and the like. Uh, sadly, I'm not gonna give you an answer, Alberta, because the reality is very different from uh, the place where we can ask and answer this question immediately. I just want to remind everybody here, most of you know this, people who do seasonal forecasts are not specialists in seasonal forecasts primarily. Seasonal forecasts have traditionally, and they still are today, a byproduct of other focuses on the institutes themselves. So you look at the metaphysics model, the, the seasonal forecast is in effect something that uses the climate model that's used for climate projections. You look at ECMWF, it uses the model that it developed, the prediction system developed for medium range, and then it just extends that to seasonal, optimizing it in a, in a, in a variety of ways. So you always inherit a model, an atmosphere, an ocean, a coupla, ideally from the same institution and for the same same kind of setup, but not always even that. We know that, for example, CMCC uses an American model. It's all a matter of combining things that are on the shelf. So I think whilst the research community has work to do and it's working on improving the representation of ocean atmosphere and interactions between the two, I think that the, the immediate gains and, and the place where now we could put our efforts in, and by now I mean in the next round of funding even, uh, is in extracting the information that we have from our current models. Uh, and this is something that I think still has some way to go. And forgive me, I don't normally, for sake of brevity, I tend to just say, talk about the things that could be done better. I really would like to take a moment to, to, to say what, in my opinion, Secli Firm has done excellently. Uh, one thing is, is the approach from the user end. And I really saw the stuff that uh, goes towards in the direction of, of uh, what Laurent was talking about, timescales, of modeling infrastructure do not make any difference to users. That is a completely artificial construct in the user space. Starting from the user question has allowed some of the case studies in Secli Firm to bring in some seasonal forecast, sub-seasonal forecast, to bring in the extended range from ECNWF, which actually effectively provides the, the, the useful data for the timescales of the decision making. Uh, the other thing I like very much is the tailoring of the outputs to the user question and the visualization and the interaction with that data. Uh, that was really nice. Uh, and also the fact that you address case studies, rather than looking at skill. To me, the notion of skill is a scientific thing. The, 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 the desire to summarize everything in a number, it's a scientific uh, summary kind of view of things in which you just compare various generations of things. It doesn't make much sense in the real world. In the real world, we have situations where things are more predictable, as pa Pascal referred to, windows of opportunity, situations in which chaos prevails. And knowing about the average skill probably doesn't tell you very much about that. I think the, one of the places of community uh, of, of scientists, science, statisticians or the like, which puts on effort is trying to improve the way in which the metrics for evaluation are, uh, are, are created so that they answer real user questions. One of the things we like, we saw here is, oh, I have an event. I know I suffered from a cold winter, freezing pipes, uh, drought. Uh, how did the forecast do in that case? But I would also want to know if this particular forecast that did so well in that case doesn't always alert you to an event like that. So I want to check for false alarms as well, because to use it in an operational sense, to use it now uh, for winter of 2021, 2022, I need to make sure that when the model says that it's going to be cold and the pipes are going to freeze, I'm not going, it doesn't say that all the time. I mean, this is one of the things. And lastly, um, I want to advocate uh, and to agree very strongly with a, with a need for tools. I think putting Tools allows not just what Marco uh, pointed out, that uh, the technicalities of using this data are immense and they're hard to, to get over. So putting tools in place, and by tools, I don't mean things that require you to know Python. Uh, you can just have some customizable uh, um, questions that you can answer. It allows you to do evaluation of uh, the model that you have access to. One of the things we didn't speak about is, is the use of multimodels. We've heard many times that combinations, ideal combinations were derived. In reality, nobody works with the ideal combination or not for more than five minutes because that ideal combination has a lifespan. So uh, having this, this facility to allow users who don't need to learn programming, who don't need to know the intricacies of the data to persuade themselves if the data that they find is for them uh, is, is really important. Um, so yes. And, and I hate. I, I hate to interrupt you, uh, Anka, but uh, you, you've made a, 
great points and uh, I think we'll have a lot to ponder about them. And um, yeah, some of the things uh, we also touched on in previous meetings uh, with the uh, multimodal combinations, how we, the best combinations and so on, the visualization, um, you know, the fact that, that we need to really re reduce the complexity in the information we provide. Um, so some of the tools available are still pretty complex for most people and so on. So um, before, without spending more time on my side, I'd like to hear now, we still have Andrea and Marco. So we go to Andrea first and, and Marco will wrap up uh, the conversation. And if we have time, then we can take one or two questions from you. Andrea. Yeah, uh, um, I try to, yeah, to think about what the modeling community could do. As Anka said, actually, uh, each operational group has a, uh, the model as an heritage to use for, for uh, predictions. Uh, but there's one thing, one opportunity, I think, for the um, seasonal, for the prediction community, uh, to the seasonal prediction community to, to contribute to the models. And this uh, yeah, has to do with the fact that seasonal prediction are still initial value problems. So the use of the latest generation observation uh, observational data is fundamental uh, for the initialization, but not only. In, in my opinion, uh, we can do more uh, in order to uh, to avoid that the, uh, after the initialization, the model drift and, and eventually have even a coupling shock uh, that could destroy the initial signal from the uh, from the observations. Yeah, I think this is quite fundamental. Um, and of course, uh, the opportunity in modeling to do this is to try to use the latest generation, the great amount of observation that we are getting now from the, um, the latest satellite campaign is we have a really a lot of big data information in there to use to constrain the modeling and, and especially the processes and especially the parameterization in the model. Yeah, in, in my experience, uh, there's uh, really uh, a great need for that for the land surface parameterization that really uh, and, and the processes that we need uh, uh, to advance the prediction over land, which still is where we live and where most of the social and economic um, uh, interests are based. So um, we are working on that. Uh, we need to, to go faster probably. And there are a bunch of projects that uh, are dealing with this. Sorry, a bit long. That's good. Yeah, thank you very much. So we uh, we also listen now about a bit of physics, but that not only that. Uh, but yeah, we encourage you to uh, produce as much as you can. There are many users waiting for your results uh, from your research. So we look forward to your results. And uh, yeah, just uh, to add before we move to Marco, there is um, also uh, an additional point from Loran, who says that uh, forecast in any case brings additional information. So that, uh, that is always useful, even if uh, uh, it's not always as skillful as you would expect. Marco, over to you. So how would you answer this question? Thanks. Well, already it's been answered mostly by Anka and Andrea. So um, from my point of view, uh, so the problem is complex. So this, this is a long chain of a many, I would say many tools. Uh, so we maybe spend the effort on the post-processing, also the usage, uh, also to on um, the edu education of the end users that maybe use the instrument in a wrong way or not really the best way or to understand what they can do because uh, there are something that you can do, something that you can be improved and something that maybe just impossible or a nonsense. So, uh, so that has to be clear also maybe from our point of view, there could be some uh, misunderstanding or confusion. So maybe we need also more uh, effort on the education. So to to tell to the user what they can expect from this instrument. So I, of course, I cannot expect a forecast of the precise days uh, on the next three months. Uh, but there's something that has to be said, I guess. Uh, I mean, say that uh, I'm convinced that most effort has to to be spent on the science. So again, I guess that uh, we need to spend uh, again effort on the physics dynamics to understand because at the very end, a model uh, needs to reproduce a phenomenal physics uh, within an error. So you have to reproduce the, the, the physical variables. And maybe I, I agree with Andrea, I'm not an expert, but it seems to me that we have a problem of initial data. So I, I think that that's a problem uh, and maybe what to spend uh, also to encourage you to increase in the observation, even uh, as a, I would say some 
political pressure, I don't know. So it's a problem that cannot be solved only by the researcher. So it's a more uh, a great problem. It maybe could be useful, I guess, a pressure or also by the, the users, so the stakeholder. So not only by scientific community, some kind of a common action for a common problem, I would say. Excellent. I think that's a great point where to end the discussion. Um, I think those all these points uh, uh, were, would be very useful. We'll uh, type them up and uh, provide them to Alessia and colleagues at the EU because uh, together with the discussion, also the other discussion in the meeting. But this, uh, I think we touched on uh, uh, great points um, about initialization. Also, there's a lot to say. Of course, so this is initialization season forecasting main, is mainly from ocean. So the, uh, the problem is uh, to sample the ocean well enough. Uh, but that's uh, that's a little technical. I'm afraid, Anka, I, I would like to, uh, I mean, if it's really 20 seconds because we need to move to the next session. I would like to, I would like to just make our recommendations as a members of the steering group for the report, uh, a recommendation for the funding agencies of which we don't have any in the room now. I think the, uh, the, the crystallization of the focus of the research funding and the services funding ought to be better than it is at the moment so that they work in complementarity rather than everybody asks from the end to end group. This is why we don't get enough focus on the work on developing models and on developing improving initializations and the like, because the research agenda is not sufficiently well focused. So I think this should be a, re a recommendation that comes out of our, of, our, of our report. Given that it's important to advance the science, I think the research agenda should be focusing, return to the focus on developing the, the technology for this methodology. Thank you.